Wonderful to be here with you this Sabbath day. There are so many exciting things happening now as we're approaching the second coming that we have to look at today. And so I invite you to kneel with me as we begin our study of the Word. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for thy holy word that is a guide to us in this dark world of sin and rebellion, a guide that will points the way and leads us through the influence of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, to eternal life and an eternal home with thee in the heavens and also the earth made new. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to grace our assembly today Please speak to our hearts, win our hearts to thy great love, to self-surrender to thee, to renounce our will and to choose thy will and thy way at all times and all places, and keep us all in the hall of thy hand, we pray, and may we have a true Sabbath day's rest, rest of spirit, because we have learned to rest our souls upon the righteousness of Christ, is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. <clears throat> Our scripture reading is found in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3, and we want to look at some of the verses leading up to that verse, and we begin with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 16 and following. <clears throat> For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that's the blessed hope. That's the great heartbeat of Adventism, of Seventh-day Adventism. <clears throat> Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. <clears throat> we are told by the pen of inspiration that men will be buying and selling, business will be going on, despite the fact that the faithful are in the crevices of the rocks, business will still be taking place. So that should tell you something. There will be a persecuted minority that does not go along with the Papal New World Order, that does not go along with the mark of the beast, who will be in dungeons, in prisons, and in the caves of the mountains. <clears throat> At the same time, business will be carried on as usual because the coming of the Lord will be like a thief in the night, it says, for when they shall say, peace and safety. Now, I just recently bought a book about the issue of the problem of trying to have complete security, complete safety. You're never going to have that in this world. But that's what men are aiming for. In fact, they're aiming for it so much now that an entire new category of law has been created while we're all going about our daily work, we don't even know what's taking place until we begin getting little figments of it in the news. Well, <clears throat> there's a whole new world that is developing out there that the average American knows nothing about. There's a whole new world that is developing in the court systems and in places such as Guantanamo. Some friends sent me this book. It's one of the most astonishing books I've ever read. Eight O'Clock Ferry to the Windward Side. What is the Windward Side? It's the Windward Side of the uh, estuary or the uh, body of water, uh, the Windward Side of the Guantanamo Naval Base down in Cuba. This man is a lawyer who represents about 50 men in the uh, Guantanamo Base. As of the time of about two weeks ago, there have been about 759 people that finally came out in Guantanamo. Only 10 at that point in time had ever been charged, and no one had ever been found guilty. There were children who were taken at the age of 11 and put in Guantanamo. 
What had happened was, after 9-11, America offered a bounty of $5,000 to anyone who would turn in a suspicious person who might be connected with Al-Qaeda. And on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, for example, my wife and I had been on that border years ago before, before the uh, Russians invaded Afghanistan, and we know a little of what it's like there. But anyone there who turned someone in to the American authorities got $5,000. So they just turned them in left and right. They had no connection with terrorism. Some of them were university professors, and they have languished and they have been tortured with the most horrible tortures so bad I can't describe them to you here today. And some of them, the man who wrote the book, the lawyer who wrote the book, said that the person who was tortured requested for it not to be revealed some of the things that were done to them. Some of them tortured for years in places like Morocco. Terrible, terrible new tortures that have been developed in our time. <clears throat> Well, why do I mention all of that? Because there is a whole segment of our society now that is going in a certain direction. For instance, <clears throat> I have here a little news blurb about Fox's series 24. Now, I've never seen even one episode of this series. But this uh, from InfoWars says, last night on Fox's series 24, they paid tribute to torture again and showed it in a positive light. They had the Secretary of Defense's son in interrogation. The interrogator was ordered to torture him to find out what he knew, even though the interrogator thought that this kid was innocent. He was ordered to go in and strap this guy to a chair and inject him with something that would make all of his nerve endings feel like they were on fire. And the fellow screamed, etc., etc. But the point is that an entire series, television series, is dedicated on this Catholic channel to promoting torture in our society and its acceptance by the population. Same thing by the uh, Roman Catholic trained talk show hosts, continually supporting torture. Uh, just, it is absolutely appalling to me. I never, I, I couldn't believe that this would have happened when I was a boy. When I was a, first learned to read and I was reading books. I think I must have been about eight years old. Maybe I was a little older than that. But I remember reading a book on the Secret Service, and I was just appalled to think that America, the land of the free and home of the brave, had secret police. That was a shock to me. Well, they're one of the more innocuous branches of, of this type of thing today. It has all proliferated. My point is here that the vast bulk, for instance, in Nazi Germany. If it wasn't happening to them, they went on with life as usual. It was fine with them if, if the government picked up uh, the trade unionists or the communists or, or uh, one group after another and hauled them off to uh, detention camps and concentration camps and even death camps. And many of them aided and abetted it. And that is exactly the scenario working out here. I remember even as a young man in college thinking, how could the day ever come when Americans would want to dress up in all kinds of uniforms and, and walk around like they did in Nazi Germany? It's happened. Uh, and it's happening on a much greater scale because this time it's global. The Central Intelligence Agency has 100 secret prisons around the world. And people are being abducted. Thousands of people now have been abducted they're taken right off the street. One of them was in the midst of talking to his lawyer, and the phone conversation was cut off. And they're taken, and they have their clothes all cut off of them. They're given an enema, put in diapers, hoods over their head, uh, strapped into a, a luxury business jet, and taken to places like Uzbekistan, um, and Egypt, Syria. Many of them who go to Egypt are never seen again and uh, they disappear into black holes. Some of them are outsourced to these countries who routinely practice the most terrible torture. Some of them boil people alive. Um, there's a whole new kind of torture I'm not going to get into with you here today, but suffice it to say that the end times are upon us. 
And we need to each one make our calling and election sure. We need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. We need to be surrendered fully and know our God because Ellen White tells us that time is going to come when we will be put in places where no human ear will hear our cry for help. Well, that's already happening. It's not happening to God's true people yet. But you have to understand how Rome works. When Rome developed the Crusades, there were several objectives that the papacy had. One was to unite all of Europe together behind the papacy, which that accomplished. They told how terrible Islam was, that it was taking over the holy places, we need to have a crusade. And the kings of Europe came with their armies and, and began fighting the Muslims. One of the orders was the Knights of Malta, and they run the Central Intelligence Agency from the very beginning. It was the Knights of Malta that set it up. They've been running it all along, and they control it. And they're fighting Islam once again, the same pattern. Watch for the patterns in history. Then once the momentum was established with fighting Islam over in the Holy Land, then they directed the Crusades against the Waldenses and the Albigenses and the dissenters in Europe. And that is how I believe it's, we're going to see it happen now at the end of time. So people are saying peace and safety. And at the same time, there are thousands of people who are languishing in prison, some of them 1.5 meters by 1.5 meters. You know how far that is? A meter is slightly over a yard <clears throat> in a cell that size. One of the, one of the uh, interrogation areas in Syria is called the grave by the people who've been there because the, the uh, cells are the size of a coffin. <clears throat> when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. So, now is the time to make our calling of God for sure. Now is the time to know our God, to know the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And... <clears throat> I would like to have a switch over now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in this context. <clears throat> Starting with verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And we are told in Testimonies to Ministers 111 that we, one of the great works that we are called to do is to expose the workings of the man of sin. Now why does God want the workings of the man of sin exposed? Because to be forewarned is to be forearmed. To understand the enemy is very important in a battle. Without that, as Sun Tzu said, you are, you'll, you'll probably lose every time. You have to know your God, you have to know yourself, and you have to know your enemy. We need to know the moral workings of our own hearts. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, do we, how do we respond? And do we yield? And do we... Repent of our sins and do are we washed in the blood of the Lamb and are we uh, solid in there in a union of faith with Christ? Now the mystery for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, that lawless one, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So notice, the papacy is the mystery of iniquity. And the papacy is going to be destroyed with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And that's the point I'm wanting to focus here. We must receive the love of the truth. We must love the truth. Love the Lord. Love the truth. It's something that we learn. It's something that we experience. We learn the fear of the Lord. We learn to love Christ. We learn to love the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, today, I want to 
go in an in-depth study with you about what is happening in the field of religion. It's happening in the field of religion all around the world, and it is really happening in the structure right now, and it is really happening with the historics right now. It is a very, very interesting phenomenon. When I came back from teaching in Africa in the mid-70s, the hippie era had gone through its cycle with the end of the 60s. The Jesus people had arisen as an as a outgrowth of the hippie movement. And it was now about 1975. And coming back from Africa, where I had preached to Africans out under a tree in the bush, hundreds of Africans, I felt like I was living in the first century. When you were walking down a uh, dirt road near the college, any African coming by on his bicycle would stop and get off his bike and talk for a half an hour. Now all of a sudden I was put in a school of the professed people of God where people walk by with their heads down like this. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we're afraid to even say hi. It might shatter their psyche or something. And it was the loneliest place I had ever been in the world in my life. And I couldn't believe it. And I was all of a sudden being exposed to classes where, um, like principles of worship, where we had books recommending dancing, the very thing you see now with celebration and all of that. Anyway, I would get in my car and do what I had learned to do for many years, head out into the wilderness. <laughs> I had done that for years down in, in, at Southern, <coughs> And that was my lifeline with heaven. And to go out into the mountains, commune with God, take my Bible, take some spirit prophecy. So I would head out and I'd go up, up the freeway, up to the forest to the north. And on the way, I flipped on the radio and I heard the Jews for Jesus. Oh, what testimonies. I hadn't heard anything like that since the revival at Andrews when I was at AUC, I mean the revival at AUC. My wife was in the revival at Andrews and I was in the revival at AUC. But it refreshed my soul. Here were Jews who had been longing for the Messiah to come. And all of a sudden they, dis they discovered Jesus. And they just would tell how thrilled they were to find the Messiah. They wanted everyone to know that he was the Messiah. Now I knew that they weren't Seventh-day Adventists. And I knew that they didn't know all the truth. But it did refresh my soul to hear their testimonies as I headed on up, and then I'd go on up into the forest, and I had wonderful places where I would go and, and commune with God and, and uh, study sometimes all day long. I'd take my books along and study. I had a forest ranger one time come in. It was late afternoon, and wondered what I was doing up there. He said, I've seen your car parked in all these places along here. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm in graduate school, I'm studying, I just love the wilderness. He understood, and we had a good visit. But what was this phenomenon that was going on? At the same time, then, well, a few years later, my wife and I, I, I got married in the interview. My wife and I were looking for a church where we could raise our children, and it was more spiritual. We had a new pastor who'd come into the the main Pioneer Memorial Church who was talking about celebration all the time. Sabbath morning celebration, midweek celebration was prayer meeting, celebration. And I knew what he was doing. He was preparing the people. It was a conservative part of the world there in southwestern Michigan. It's close to the Chicago area. It's the Midwest, the heartland. He had to linguistically prepare the people, giving them the terminology. This is how change takes place. And I knew it. I knew what he was doing. And it was very disturbing to me. So we started checking out some of the little churches. And one of the little churches we went to quite a bit, there was another seminarian there who occasionally would teach a class, and he wore a prayer shawl. The first time I had encountered that, a Jewish prayer shawl. Later on, I would encounter it over and over again in our camp meetings. These were bellwethers. These were straws in the wind of something that was coming. A whole new phenomenon. And I would like to look at you, look at this with you today. Let me give you a little more orientation to what's happening before we go into it so you see the significance of it. At Andrews, on Friday nights, faculty will get together 
as the Sabbath is being welcomed in, and they will light a menorah. You know what a menorah is? The candlestick, which is a replica of, of the candlestick that was in the uh, sanctuary. Then they will sing a Jewish chant. Then there are many of them on campus who will do Jewish dancing. In 1999, some friends of ours went to Andrews and they asked where there might be a conservative um, <coughs> church to attend, and they were directed to a certain church, and to, of, to their amazement, here was a man, like a great rabbi, with a skull cap on, and they were issuing skull caps to all of the men coming in. But they, they're called kippas in, uh, in Jewish uh, ling uh, lingo. And the wife of the rabbi who was speaking went around with her timbrel dancing a Jewish dance, and it was a Jewish service. <coughs> then, Today, one of the big professors at Andrews in the Old Testament department holds a monthly service. Do you have that? We were going to show you the ad for it. <coughs> Somehow it escaped us on this trip. <coughs> but he holds a Jewish Adventist service. <coughs> there are now Hebrew Adventist churches all across the nation and in places like Brazil and um, Israel and around the world. <clears throat> Why is this? What is happening? What is behind this? Why do we have the wife of the dean of the seminary holding a meeting for a weekend with the women in the conference and telling them what she learned about keeping the Sabbath from living in Israel and her contact with the Jews? Is there something defective in our understanding of the Sabbath that this has to happen? And is it something that should be done or should not be done? <clears throat> well, we have, a, we have a very interesting phenomenon taking place. And it is a phenomenon of Messianic Judaism now swamping the structure. It is swamping <coughs> Andrews University from people who are there who have been in touch with us. They say it is permeating everything. In the 90s, in the late 90s, I was doing some research on the internet and I discovered a Messianic Jewish website that said for 140 years, Seventh-day Adventism has nobly carried the torch of the Sabbath, the sanctuary, the Second Coming, and the Biblical Diet. But since 1980, they have been in apostasy, and now it is the work of Messianic Judaism to take over Adventism and carry that on. And yet, let me tell you what my experience has been with the Messianic Jews that I have met. They're a broad spectrum. Some of them are extremely fervent and <clears throat> so excited about Christ. Others are New Agers. There are some that claim to be Messianic Jewish Seventh-day Adventists who come with alcohol on their breath. Because you see, the Messianic Jews see no problem with drinking wine. And the Messianic Jews <coughs> have seen no problem with jewelry. And <clears throat> I have yet to find one Messianic Jew in all of my experiences who actually believes and lives by the spirit of prophecy. It, to them, it just doesn't matter. So something is happening, and it's something very, very big. And it's going to come and touch your life somewhere sooner or later, and more powerfully or less powerfully. But I want to study with you how this movement got going and what the ramifications of it are. Because a year and a half ago, a year and a quarter ago, we were holding a home church deep in the mountains, a very beautiful place surrounded by mountains. And there was a family that had been invited. They were not Seventh-day Adventists, but they were Messianic Jews. I could tell as soon as I saw them. They had their interlinear Bibles. And <clears throat> as soon as I was through preaching, they came rushing up and they told me, 
that the seventh day Sabbath had been lost over the centuries, that the week had been lost. And therefore, the only way to tell what day was the Sabbath was by the moon. And they had a way of calculating it by the new moon. And <clears throat> that anyone who didn't do it that way was not going according to God's calendar. Let me tell you something. This is now worldwide. We are now having material sent into us about this. <clears throat> the Gospel Sabbath, the case for lunar-based observance. Historics are into this. And it is spreading like wildfire in the Southwest. <clears throat> The Lunar Sabbath. These are things that have been sent into our ministry. So, today, let's go to the roots of how this whole thing got going, what is driving it, what the arguments are. It's going to take us two services, so when I'm near the end of this one, just let me know. We'll cut, and then we'll go to the next one, uh, you know, after we have our... Um, Preliminaries. <clears throat> so, how does the, how do these things happen? First of all, I would like to discuss with you about the mystery of iniquity. Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is an expert at creating religions. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Rome is an expert at creating <coughs> religions. If you've read the works of Alberto Rivera, who was assassinated, what was it, a few years ago by the Jesuits. He's an ex-Jesuit. <clears throat> he tells in there how in his study in the archives of the Vatican, how it was the Vatican that established Islam. Why did they establish Islam in the seventh century? Because they wanted to uh, capture Jerusalem and they wanted an army to go down into North Africa and slaughter all of the heretics. The North African Christians who did not submit to the papacy. And so they created Islam. And Muhammad was uh, selected. He married a uh, Roman Catholic wife. His, uh, I believe it was his uncle or at least a, some relative, may have been a little more distant than that, was a Roman Catholic who was immersed deeply in the writings of Augustine, who taught him. And so the religion of Islam was born. It is a mixture of the religion of the worship of the moon. Why do you always see the crescent? New moons? You... Uh, it, is a, it is a mixture of the religions of the Arabic tribes along with Roman Catholicism. And so they both have a certain veneration for Mary. And uh, they both have uh, a common understanding of much of the beginning of the Old Testament. Although they change things when it comes to uh, Ishmael because... Uh, and. Uh, and Abraham in order to fit their theories. But my point is that Rome created Islam. And it was a very successful creation. And in fact, the armies of Islam became so powerful that by the time of Martin Luther, several centuries along, they were threatening to exterminate Christianity in Europe. They were pounding at the gates of Vienna on the east and they were coming up through Spain on the west. There was a pincer movement, and they were after the nation, the continent of Europe. The same thing is happening today. This, do you realize that Kosovo was just recognized as a nation? It is a Muslim nation that America and NATO broke away from Serbia. Serbia was the bastion of Christianity against Rome. For centuries, Rome hates Serbia. Rome hates Orthodox Christianity, which the Serbs are. And that's why we had the bombing of Serbia under Bill Clinton, to break the back of Serbia so they had no military, and they were defenseless then. And so Kosovo could be broken away. There was the issues of oil, of course, also an oil pipeline that they wanted to build through there. Very mineral rich. But now there is a Muslim state in Europe Meanwhile, millions of Muslims have flooded into Europe and are just taking it over. 
In fact, they are so powerful in Holland <clears throat> that a man in Parliament who's dared to speak out against them and against what their, their plan is to take over Europe, because that's their plan, to take over Europe. They've wanted Europe for centuries. This man who is in Parliament has to live in a maximum security cell at night. It's the only way the police can guarantee his safety. And the Muslims are openly talking about taking over Europe. They're erecting minarets in Switzerland, all along the rail lines. There are entire parties rising up in Europe saying, how can we let Europe become Muslim? How can we let it be taken over? You've seen the riots, hundreds and hundreds of cities in France. Incredible thing. But this is a religion that Rome created. Just remember that. Rome creates religions for various purposes. Now, <clears throat> I want to take you up to the 20th century, to the keys of this blood. And in this book, Malachi Martin, who is an ex-Jesuit, tells about how Pope John Paul II, who was Pope at that time, surveyed the world and categorized every religious group into a war room. He had four, five war rooms. The first war room is Islam, who, are, who we call the Angelus. The second provincial globalist situation room, <laughs> one set of maps and action models, is shared by several groups of Christians. This is from 285, the Keys of this Blood. Who are these people? Adventists, <coughs> Baptistic and evangelist, evangelical sects, and non-Christians, Christian scientists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, <coughs> Unitarians. Why are they in this group? <clears throat> this group is called the Minimalists because they believe that the day of the Lord is coming and the Lord is going to bring all, Israel, all the world to account and they don't believe that everyone is going to become a member of their religion. Now, why are Adventists singled out? Page 286. <clears throat> Despite the mutual differences, for instance, between the Advent Christian Church, the Church of God of Abrahamic faith, and the Seventh-day Adventists, they are at one in the opposition to Rome as the Red War of the Mediterranean. So, Notice now the features of Seventh-day Adventism that Rome is wanting to change. First issue is <clears throat> they are concerned about Seventh-day Adventism because it sees Rome as the Red War of the Mediterranean. Where does the word war come from? From Revelation 17. So Rome wants to get rid of Adventism's opposition to the papacy. Does Messianic Judaism do that? Oh, yes. Yes, I've had enough contact with them to see that. Given their separate, um, well, let's see, I'll drop down here. They, all these churches now in this group arose within the context of rebellion against the authority and privileged teaching power of the Roman church. So, Rome looks at Adventism, they say, it was born in rebellion against us. So we've got to remove that rebellion. That's been steadily done. Look at Bacchiocchi, for example. Jesuit trained at Gregorian Pontifical University. He writes his dissertation, which is opposed to the spirit of prophecy, openly. And then he goes around to the colleges and dresses in his pontifical robes, and he uh, tells what a wonderful fellow John Paul II is, breaking down resistance to Rome. That's just one small thing. Now we have, now we have Jesuit spiritual formation being taught from grade run one right on through in, in certain areas and around the world and to all of the <clears throat> all of the uh, ministers Bible teachers and uh, administrators and evangelists around the world now another thing that Rome doesn't like about Adventism is that it believes in the wall of separation of church and state that has to be broken down. Now, a very interesting thing happened on Ten Commandments Day. We monitored the various religious stations on the first Ten Commandments Day. And I think everyone here is probably familiar with the Ten Commandments Day Commission. And there was a rabbi who came on late in the day, and he said that uh, as far as keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, he said that's not required of Gentiles. They can keep any other day. 
as long as they keep one day. And uh, Sunday keeping is fine. And um, every, everyone eventually will keep Shabbat. But for now, the Gentiles aren't expected to keep seventh day like the Jews. I thought very, very interesting. Uh, Judaism has been a major resistor of the National Sunday Law along with Seventh-day Adventism. So one thing that's being accomplished by making Jews Messianic Jews is elimination of opposition to a National Sunday Law. Very interesting. Another thing is liberty of conscience. They don't like that about Adventism that every person is free to choose whether they will serve God or not. A person is free to to believe whether what they want to believe. It's called Protestantism's dangerous idea. Um, a book has been written recently on that with that very title, Protestantism's, Protestantism's dangerous idea, and that's the idea that every person can read the Bible and under the Holy Spirit interpret the Bible for himself. Rome holds that no one has a right to a moral wrong and it's Rome that decides what's a moral wrong. If Rome decides it's morally wrong to keep Sabbath instead of Sunday, you are wrong and you have no right to your position. You see, those who believe in liberty of conscience believe every person has the freedom to choose under God what day they will keep. It doesn't mean that they'll have the right come to the right conclusion, but they have the freedom to make that choice, liberty of conscience. Now, <clears throat> coming down through the various situation rooms, you come to the fifth situation room, and guess who is in that one? <laughs> in the fifth generation room is the Jews, and. Uh, they are in that group because of their apartness, their separateness. The Japanese, the Chinese, and the Jews. And why does Rome put them in the fifth situation room with all of the maps and all the plans to empower them? Because they haven't been able to penetrate them. They're separate. They are apart. And Rome has not been able to penetrate and control them. That's why they're in the fifth room. So Rome develops a strategy for penetration and control. Now notice what Rome wants to do in War Room 2 with Adventism, and what Rome wants to do in War Room 5 with Judaism. Now, <clears throat> how is Rome going to accomplish this? And I submit to you, Rome has accomplished this with a very brilliant strategy. And we want to back up now and look at how the Jesuits think, because the Jesuits are the master strategists who accomplish what Rome wants to do with religions. I have several sources here, for instance, the Jesuits by Malachi Martin, and <clears throat> the Jesuits began studying Teilhard de Chardin in the 1950s. Now, You've heard me talk about Teilhard de Chardin before. <clears throat> Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit, a Frenchman, and he was brilliant. He had a brilliant mind, and he worked a lot in China, and he <coughs> developed a lot of writings. They were so radical that he was at odds with the Pope, but the Jesuit order liked what he wrote. Now I have a book here by W. Henry Kenny, S.J., who was a Jesuit, A Path Through Teilhard's Phenomenon. So I'm going to put something up here, Phenomenology. I want you to have a little brief look now at how the Jesuits work to overthrow a church and how they work to create new religious movements. What is phenomenology? <clears throat> Hegel was a philosopher, a German philosopher, 
who lived during the time of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, and he wrote this book, The Phenomenology of Spirit. Hegel theorized that there was a world spirit, that there was a master spirit that controlled the human race. It was a form of pantheism. Now the hippies in the hippie movement were exposed heavily to Hegel's philosophy. And Americans didn't even know what was going on because they don't think philosophically. They don't think in philosophical categories. But the, um, the, the, the massive unleashing in the hippie revolution of new forces was due to this phenomenology. And let me explain to you a little bit of how it works. In the field of philosophy, phenomena is something that has an appearance, that has an impact on a brain. I don't have his book here, but the Nazi philosopher uh, and Jesuit trained philosopher Heidegger wrote a book called Being and Time. And it's a big, thick book. And what he wrote in there was that we are all embodied time. In other words, we're the embodiment of the experiences that we have passed through in time. And I thought, how interesting that is, because have we been exposing ourselves to the Bible? Have we been exposing ourselves to the Holy Spirit? Have we been exposing ourselves to an um, anchoring of our character in the Bible and in, in Christ and in the Holy Spirit? Or have we been exposing ourselves to other phenomena? So, here is, here is a book, uh, Path Through Teilhard's Phenomenon. And Teilhard, one of his big books was The Phenomenon of Man, he wrote. The Phenomenon of Man. And here are some of the terms that he, that Teilhard used. Christogenesis. That is the idea that through pantheism, all of humanity is moving closer and closer to Christ. Uh, cosmogenesis. And that is that the whole cosmos, the whole universe, the world, is moving toward an end point, an omega point. <clears throat> Neogenesis is another word to use. Nous is, nous is mind in Greek. This means the coming together of minds. Have you ever seen, heard anything much of Buddhism on this in our culture? If everyone thinks the same thing, it'll come to pass. The coming together of the minds. And the idea is, with all of this, these are all pantheistic concepts based on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. <clears throat> that when all the minds come together to a certain point, then Christ will appear. So, what the Jesuits are wanting to do, they started studying from about 1950 on, in their seminaries around the world, they studied Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. And they got, so they were just on fire with the idea to convert the whole idea, the whole world, to this concept. Well, you heard, you hear the songs on the radio. I'd like to teach the world to sing. How does it go? In perfect harmony? The times they are changing. Well, what happened was when we come down to the 1960s, the mid 1960s, you uh, you have at the Gesu in Rome, Jesuit Congregation 31 taking place. The Jesuits met. They have their GC sessions too, and at their GC session, they decided, they elected Pedro Arupe to be their new Black Pope their Jesuit Superior General, and he was on fire, you can read about it here, Malachi Martin, to change the whole world into the image of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's thinking. Now, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin is known to be the intellectual guru of the hippie movement. The thing that hit the young people in America in, from 1966 through 1968 through 1970 was PR, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's thinking. Now, what phenomena did 
the Jesuits use to convey this thinking. They use music. And this is very, very interesting because, of course, you know, the Lucifer was head of the heavenly choirs. But what happened to Protestantism in the late 1960s? With the new generation, it just collapsed like a deck of cards. And millions of Protestant youth left their parents, left the idea of, of uh, being involved in the work ethic, and they lived in communes. They lived in houses. They didn't even bother to take the garbage out, just piled up by the door. They grew their hair long. You know, I went through it. Some of you are too young to have lived through it. But there was a singer, <clears throat> a Jewish singer. Now, all of this has great significance for what is happening in Adventism now. It may not seem like it to you, but wait till we get to the end of the picture. There was a Jewish singer named Bob Zimmerman, Robert Zimmerman. Have you ever heard of Zimmerman? Well, he took the name Bob Dylan. Have you ever heard, ever heard of Bob Dylan? Yes. He conveyed much of this thinking through his music. He was the American icon, you might say. <clears throat> he was Jewish. <clears throat> and uh, it's very interesting. He wrote a book about his life recently. And I looked at it because I went through this era and I wanted to understand what, what took place. Fundamental changes took place. Fundamental changes took place in Adventism. I was from a small town in western New York where, you know, 200,000 geese came through every fall and every spring. And we were dominated by nature and the lakes and the fields and the woods and the forest. And when I went away to college at Atlantic Union College, I couldn't believe it. They had a hippie religion. And I remember one of the student leaders walking along in front of the boys' arm, and all of a sudden he turned, flew out his arms like this, and said, you've got to love everybody. Well, it sounded good. I mean, who can argue with love? But I wondered, is that the love of God? Is that the love that we're talking about in the gospel? Or is this a, some kind of a self-generated love? What is this? Then I would go to a certain class, and it was by the elite students, the elite of the elite, from the privileged homes, you know. I found out that these students were into drugs. They were taking drugs to expand their minds. And they were student leaders. And they were teaching Sabbath school classes. So my point is, it was impacted immediately on Adventist campuses. And down at the General Conference headquarters, they, this, the young people went up to the GC <coughs> headquarters and they threw the youth instructor on the ground and they spat on it and they stomped on it. And so what was the GC to do? They got rid of it. <laughs> and they brought in the new pantheistically oriented liberation theology social gospel insight magazine. And when my conservative principal got the first Insight magazine, he saw he was so mad, he threw it across his office. He wanted to get rid of it. He knew what it meant right away. The whole structure had caved, just like that. And a whole generation of Adventist youth lost their devotion to the Lord, lost their devotion to the truth, and they were involved in pantheism. And now... This thing has developed now for two generations. But I'm going to want to take you down a certain strain of what happened. Because in this hippie movement, one of the leaders was Hillary Clinton. She was featured on the front, I believe it was Time Magazine, a student of the year, person of the year. She was a, a student rebel at the 1968 Democratic Convention. Now she's running for president. Do these things have an impact? Oh, I should say they do. Suddenly, the whole concept of the home collapsed in America. Suddenly, everybody was living with everybody else. And I mean, not everybody, but the whole generation. You know what I mean. But there were Jews that were the leader, leading the edge of this. They had brilliant minds. And one of them was Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. And so he had a, he was a genius when it came to music, you know. I'm not promoting his music at all, don't get me wrong. 
But I'm saying the people that were in that movement considered him the greatest musician who ever lived. Now, I would compare him with Handel. But this is the way they felt about it. The greatest musician who ever lived. And then others have said the greatest American musician in the 20th century. My point is that in his book, he tells mathematically how he knew how to create certain chords that would just drive the audience wild. And when he, he was a very reclusive type of person. And he got married, he moved to Woodstock, and he would see a car pull up and a man get out and give a little signal, and then the mobs would come over the hill to just invade his property and everything, and he just had no peace day or night, and they were calling upon him to lead the revolution. In 1966, this movement by the Jesuits was launched in America. They held their first celebration service at Fordham University, where the leading was the largest gathering of leading Jesuits in the history of North America. And Pedro Rupe held that service. That was in 66, in the mid-80s, celebration that hit Adventism. But when the hippie movement was launched in 1966, and the Jesuits came storming out of the Gesu in Rome, <clears throat> in two years, in two years, America's cities were burning. And you had people running through the cities yelling, burn, baby, burn. And they were burning the cities, and America was in revolution. Because Pierre Teilhard de Chardin had a mixture of Marxism, pantheism, Eastern religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, and Catholicism. It was a blend. And this is what they put, injected. And through the music, through the phenomenon of music, the young people, their minds were exposed to the music. Their eyes were exposed. Woodstock. Phenomenon. They knew how to use phenomenon to change people's minds and create a movement. Now, before we quit, I think, or is our time up? Our time is up. Okay, I'm going to break at this point. When we come back, <clears throat> we're going to look at what happened with the creation of Messianic Judaism, how it took place. So uh, our time is up now for Sabbath school.